Today we are going to look at the distinctions between the dorsal and ventral visual streams. And they're showed here, uh, they're shown here on this first slide, but we'll get more into the, the neuroanatomy of this uh, as we go. So last class we were looking at uh, the neuroanatomy of the visual system and the division between the cortical pathway and the subcortical pathway. So just to review quickly, uh, both pathways uh, begin with the eyes at the retina, uh, but what we see is that after the optic chiasm, the, both pathways travel down the optic track, but the subcortical pathway takes the optic track, a bit of a detour down here to the superior colliculus and then up to the pulvinar nucleus. So these are structures in the subcortex, hence the subcortical cortical pathway. Now the cortical pathway from the optic tract uh, goes to the lateral geniculate nucleus, follows the optic radiations to the primary visual cortex. Now we saw that the primary visual cortex is only the beginning of the cortical visual processing. We talked about areas V4, V5, the fusiform gyrus. I think those were the, the three major ones we went over. So there's many areas uh, further along that cortical pathway and we're actually going to look uh, deeper into those areas and how they seem to divide from the prior visual cortex into what we call the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. So here's a, just another representation, more schematic one, of our cortical pathway and our subcortical pathway, but both of these pathways continue on. We're going to see that information goes from the pulvinar actually to the cortex and from the prior visual cortex it goes to uh, many different areas within the cortex. This is just a very basic uh, neuroanatomical sketch of these two pathways. So this is uh, the primary visual cortex. And I guess this would be larger than the primary visual cortex because it really would just be along the, that calcarine sulcus. But the dorsal stream are the cortical areas that are along uh, this pathway of the brain. So this is the dorsal aspect of the brain, so it's the dorsal stream. And the ones that seem to be uh, more down here in the, the temporal lobe, um, these, uh, this stream is called the ventral stream. Now, you know, why is this up here, the, the parietal lobe, why is that the dorsal part of the brain, and why is this the ventral part of the brain? And it doesn't make as much sense in humans because our head is kind of rotated compared to most other animals. But if you think of a fish, I think it's a little easier to remember. So a fish, unlike humans, its kind of head is, is straight with its body. And if you think about the fins on the back of a fish, those are the dorsal fins. So if you think about a fish on its back, oh, I've got my hand in frame here, it has dorsal fins. And if you keep going up the back, and if you see which part of my brain we get to, we get to the top. So although this is the top uh, of my head, this is the, the dorsal part of my brain, and that's why the dorsal stream uh, is up here. So if, if we were to make ourselves with a fish, you'd have to be bent over, and your head would have to be kind of straight like that, so that my dorsal stream is, is on top of, the, of where my dorsal fins would be. So maybe try to think of a fish to remember that the parietal cortex, that is the, the dorsal part of your brain, and that's where the dorsal stream is. So this is that similar schematic we saw earlier, but it's been extended. So from the primary visual cortex, the cortical visual areas are largely divided into the ventral stream, so shown here in blue, and it terminates in the inferotemporal cortex. So it's saying, you know, this is your temporal cortex, your temporal lobe, and infro means it's just the inferior or lower part of that cortex. So it's not, you know, up here, it's down here in the, the lower aspects. And here we have our dorsal stream. So the dorsal stream uh, travels up to the dorsal aspects of the brain and it terminates in specifically the posterior parietal cortex. So we have our parietal cortex or our parietal lobe and it's in the more uh, posterior uh, parts of it. So you can see here that um, information via the primary visual cortex gets sent both to the dorsal stream and to the ventral stream. And when we talked about blind sight, we talked about this subcortical root, but part of the preserved abilities in blind sight are actually because this subcortical root 
does actually send information. It doesn't remain subcortical. Some of it actually goes up to uh, the cortex, to the posterior parietal cortex. So see here that there's two ways to get information to the posterior parietal cortex, via the primary visual cortex or via the, the subcortical pathway. What we're going to focus on now is what is uh, or what are the functions of these two pathways? What does the inferotemporal cortex allow us to see? And what does the posterior parietal cortex allow us to see? There's been a few different researchers who've looked at dissociations between the dorsal and ventral streams. And we're going to focus on one of the most famous uh, by um, Milner and Goodale. And they made a distinction between perception, or what we'll call uh, our what abilities. So when you look at something to know what it is. So if you look at this to know, oh, that's a computer mouse. That's a, a perceptual uh, decision. You're saying, what is that object I see? And we're going to see that our what abilities, oh, sorry, I jumped to number two here, are actually done by the ventral stream. They process what information? And that is more specifically our conscious perception. You are aware of what you see. The dorsal stream is different. It processes our how abilities. And that is, how do I use that object? So those are two different things. Knowing that this is a computer mouse, that is a what ability. Knowing how to use it, so how to get my hand there, how to move it around, uh, that is visually guided action. And that is done exclusively by the dorsal stream. So how do we know this? Well, uh, Milner and Goodale had two very special individuals who had damage. One had damage to their dorsal stream and lost the ability to do how functions, although they could do all sorts of what functions. And then they had another patient who was the exact opposite. They had damage to their ventral stream. They uh, could not make conscious perceptions but they could um, make visually guided action just fine. So let's look at those two special individuals that are really good evidence that the ability to know what something is and the ability to know how to use something uh, are completely different uh, within our visual system. So first up, we're gonna look at uh, DF. So both of these individuals, last I checked, are still alive and they actually just go by, um, I, I don't know if those are their initials or if that's a, um, a pseudonym that they came up with, but we just know them simply as, as DF and uh, RV. We'll see RV next. So DF first. She has what we call visual form agnosia. And the damage to her brain is to the destination of her ventral stream. She has damaged her infrotemporal cortex. So we're going to see that um, her what abilities are basically destroyed, but um, her how abilities, which lie in the dorsal stream, are preserved. Now a note on this name. So agnosia means uh, without knowing. So the idea here is that sh she does see things. We'll talk more about that. She's not blind. It's not like she's destroyed her primary visual cortex. So she can see things, but she sees them without knowing, agnosia, of what the visual form is. And that sounds really odd, so I'll, I'll give a few examples of, of what her perception is like. So what happened to DF? Oh, she, um, she had an injury, a brain injury. It was when she was um, a, a middle-aged woman. And basically, um, she suffered anoxia, which is a lack of oxygen to the brain from carbon monoxide poisoning. So she was sleeping one night and she had a leaky propane heater and um, that produced carbon monoxide. Thankfully, it didn't kill her, but um, part of her brain uh, was damaged from, from the carbon monoxide and it happened to be um, her, her ventral stream that was damaged. So she has visual form agnosia, so without knowledge of visual form, uh, or you know, vision without form. She is not blind, not at all. She has her primary visual cortex and some of her um, lower visual centers uh, in her brain. 
so she can see color, she can see texture, but it's those higher order abilities um, to be able to make a judgment on what something is. And this is kind of similar to prosopagnosia. So remember, an individual with prosopagnosia, they can see faces. It's not like they look at a face and it's blurred. No, they see the face, but the final perceptual judgment of who that is uh, is impaired. And it's kind of the same thing, not with faces, but with just everyday objects uh, with DF. So let's look at some examples because it's, it's kind of bizarre. <laughs> so just to reiterate, uh, her damage is to her ventral stream. Uh, so she's going to have trouble with what task, telling you what something is. But her dorsal stream is just fine. The, the, the carbon monoxide po poisoning did not affect her dorsal stream. And her visual motor function, using vision to guide her actions, is completely intact. OK, example time. So let's say we find an object and we show it to DF. So here we, we have a flashlight. And so she could see it. She'll say, oh, it's, it's made out of metal. Is it aluminum? So she's looking at the color of the metal, making a guess. It's got something red on it, so she can see red. Looks like plastic. Yep, yeah, she's right. Is it some sort of kitchen utensil? No, it's not. So she can see it. She sees the individual features. But then that final decision of saying, well, what do all those things form? You know, they form uh, a flashlight. Uh, that is what she's lost. And she will guess. She'll, she'll, she'll try to um, use what she can tell about the object and the situation she's in. So if we had her in a classroom and I handed her a blackboard marker, she might be able to guess it's a blackboard marker because she's going to see that it's plastic, it has color on it, maybe it's a, a blue blackboard marker. And then she's like, well, we're in a classroom, so she'll use the context to help her. But if we give her something weird, like uh, a flashlight, uh, when, there, you know, when there's no power outage or we're not on a camping trip, she'll see it and sh she'll have, uh, she, it's unlikely she'll be able to guess what it is in that case. This is a neat video of another individual with uh, visual form agnosia. Uh, I don't know uh, who it is exactly or exactly um, if, if they only have visual form agnosia or if they damage other parts of their brain. But it, take a look at this video and you'll see uh, what life is like for someone with visual form agnosia. A couple of notes here. So uh, the individual with the beard, he's the one with, with visual form agnosia. This is the individual testing him. And before this video starts rolling, uh, she shows him a picture of a combination lock. Now, seeing a, a picture of an object, it makes it even harder to guess what it is. So if we show you a physical object, you can, uh, like with that flashlight, you can tell there's metal, there's plastic. But here they're using pictures to make it even harder for him to tell what the object is. I mean, for us, it would be easy. Show us a picture of something, a combination lock. You see it's a combination lock. But that's the exact ability that they've lost. So he's been looking at it for a while when this video starts. And at first, he thinks it's a telephone. And the experimenter tells him, OK, it's not a telephone. And she's going to start here by giving him a choice of three objects. And he's going to try to figure out what it is. So give me a pause. Uh, check out that video. The link is in the description. So do you see how he couldn't tell what it was? Um, that ability is done by the ventral stream and he has damaged his ventral stream. He can still see, you know, he clearly sees a picture, he can see around the room. Uh, and what eventually helps him guess what it is, is his hands begin to act out what he would do on that object. And that is using vision for action. And that is done by the dorsal stream, a completely different area of the brain, which thankfully for him and um, DF is intact. So it's this weird dissociation because for us, in the same way it's hard for us to think about what blind sight would be like, it's very difficult for us to understand what it's like when only your dorsal stream works and your ventral stream doesn't, or your ventral stream works and your dorsal stream doesn't, because normally both of those are intact in us. Uh, it's only when we 
we have these very uh, unusual cases where people have injured one and not the other. So let's talk a little more about uh, D DF's abilities. So if we show her a picture, uh, similar to uh, what was done in that clip, um, you know, this would be a very easy task for us, right? You'd say, oh, that's an apple, that's a book, that's a sailboat. So you say, okay, um, what are these? DF would say, I, I don't know what they are. Uh, can you copy them? So she can write normally, she can draw. The, pro the reason her drawings aren't very good is because she doesn't know what she's looking at. And if you don't know what you're looking at, it's very hard to copy. But proof that she does know, she has a, a long-term memory of an apple, of a book, and a boat, is if instead of us giving a model, we just say, hey, think of an apple. She can think of an apple. She has a long-term memory of an apple. Now draw it. She can do that because her ability to draw is intact. Um, the reason she's not good at doing it here is because she doesn't know what she's looking at, even though she does still have an intact memory of, of objects. So at first with DF, what they had focused on, the, the, her medical doctor, uh, was what she had lost. Because they were trying to figure out you know, what was wrong with her, where is the brain damage, uh, which of her abilities are impaired. So uh, imagine this situation. They hold up a pencil and they say, OK, what is this? And, and this would be a similar response to when we showed her the flashlight. So she'd say, she might be able to say, oh, it looks like it's made out of wood. Uh, there's some metal on the end and then with that much information she might be able to guess is it a pencil or if we show it to her in an odd context uh, you know maybe she can't guess so she has troubles uh, trouble with um, a ability to tell us what it is she's looking at so you're showing her this pencil she's like yeah I don't know what it is and then the doctor said well go ahead and, and reach for it and what they were surprised to see is that even though she couldn't tell you what it was she had no trouble reaching for it. So if they held it up to her straight, like this, she would make an appropriate grasp in this direction. And if they held it to her this way, she would make an appropriate grasp in the other direction. So they're very surprised that she couldn't tell you what it is, and yet she could reach for it just fine. And, and this is because we're seeing this dissociation between the dorsal and ventral streams, uh, which is only something they, they realized after, after testing her. So this led to some experiments. They wanted to see, well, what has she lost and what is still intact? And this first experiment is uh, the, the mailbox experiment where she is uh, posting a letter in a mailbox is kind of the analogy here. So in one condition, they put a mailbox in front of her uh, or just a, a slot <laughs> and they would rotate it at different angles. And with uh, basically a, a postcard, they would say match the orientation of that mail slot. So don't actually go ahead and mail it, but just tell us what the orientation of the slot is. So in this first trial here, perfect performance would be if you said, if you if you took your postcard and, and made it uh, horizontal to match the orientation of the mail slot. So that is testing DF's uh, ventral stream, her ability to tell you what the orientation of the mail slot is. Then they also wanted to test her how ability. So now they said, go ahead uh, and put the letter in the mail slot. So go ahead and mail the letter. And to do that, you need your dorsal stream. You need vision to guide your action. That is a how ability mediated by the dorsal stream. And the idea here is that DF has damage to her ventral stream. So she, she will likely be bad at telling us the orientation of the, the letter, uh, sorry, of the mail slot, and yet, if we ask her to then post that letter, she should be fine. And this is weird, because how can someone not tell you the orientation of the mail slot and yet be able to mail the letter? That's weird, right? So in this experiment, um, imagine this is the, the mailbox and the slot, the orientation of the slot is shown by this arrow here. So on this trial, it would be vertical. Now let's just pretend that uh, DF her performance looked like this, and this could be either for where she, she actually mailed it or where she did the orientation. Uh, this is showing um, what she tried to do. Now other trials, the mail slot was in a completely different spot. Here this would be an example of a horizontal mail slot. And let's say DF's performance uh, was here. So this is you know really bad. She's, she's um, 
uh, 90 degrees to, to how it should be. So how can we compare these trials to each other? Well, what, what we're going to need to do is to fairly compare our trials, we're going to rotate them all back as if the slot was vertical. So on this trial, it's already vertical. We don't need to do anything with this trial. On this trial, it's not vertical, so we're going to rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, we're also going to ro rotate her results. Uh, now we can compare these two trials. We simply overlap them and we look at the pattern of results. So a good result would be, uh, and, and how we would do at this task, is just a bunch of trials that are uh, vertical lines. So the slot is horizontal and our result is horizontal as well. Alternatively, if we see lines like this, you know, all over the place, that would be very poor performance. So here are the results. First off, we have control participants, so neurologically intact individuals. And as you imagine, this is an easy task. If we ask you to post a letter, uh, you can do that just fine. doesn't matter the orientation of the mail slot. If we ask you to, to tell us what is the orientation of the mail slot, so don't actually mail it, just say, oh, it's angled like this, oh, it's angled like that. That is a very easy task, and we're good at that too. But what is this like in DF? And just as predicted, DF was pretty good at posting. She's a little worse than control, but this is pretty good performance. So if we ask her uh, to go ahead and post, boom, she does it. She rotates her hand perfectly. But if we ask her, what is the orientation of the mail slot? She is all over the place. And basically, she's guessing. She doesn't know. And she just guesses on each trial. She's like, I don't know, maybe it's here. Next trial, uh, maybe it's here. Every once in a while, you know, she'll be right. Uh, you know, a, a stop clock is right twice a day. Uh, but she's just guessing. So she has horrible performance. So that really shows us uh, this fascinating dissoci dissociation between perception, or what abilities, and action, or how abilities. We, we can lose one and not the other. And we know from DF that uh, perception is done by the ventral stream, because that's what has been damaged and that's what she's lost. Another example of a way to uh, test people is to look at the size of their grip aperture. So when we reach for objects, we control the size of our grip aperture, whether it's you know two fingers or, or the whole hand, uh, quite precisely to the size of the object. So if I want to reach out and um, grab my mug here, if we look at the size of the hand as I approach the mug, it scales to the, side of the size of the object. So if it's a medium-sized mug, my hand will be medium sized to, to grasp it. And if we ask people to grasp something a lot smaller, then if we look at their grasp coming in, their, their grip aperture, the size between their fingers and their thumb, would be a lot smaller. So normally, uh, neurologically intact individuals scale the size of their grip aperture to the size of the object. So we're going to use that knowledge to test DF. Here's an example of your the size of your grip aperture changing as you grasp an object. So let's look at the green line because the black one's a little hard to see. This is a, an object that's three centimeters big. And what our, our grasp does is that we open up our grasp. We actually overshoot the size of the object. This gives us a, a margin for error. And then as we get closer to the object, we scale our grip aperture down to the exact size of the object. And often, uh, scientists, we like to pull out this point right here, this the largest point of our grip aperture, which is called maximum grip aperture. And the size of that scales to the size of the object. So if we give you a bigger object to grasp, you open your fingers even bigger, uh, so this is a five centimeter object, and then again you scale it down to the size, uh, to the exact size of the object. So our grip aperture, or more specifically maximum grip aperture, uh, scales to the size of the object. So large object, large maximum grip aperture. Smaller object, smaller grip, maximum grip aperture. So let's see what that looks like in DF. So in this task, we put an object out in front of DF, a, a rectangle, kind of like a, a domino. And we, we had her do two things. And this is very similar to the mailbox experiment. 
in one task we asked her tell us how big you think that object is make a perceptual estimate of its size so this will be done with the ventral stream it's a what task um, and the way we asked her to do that is just to put her fingers out and say you know oh, it's this big oh it's this big and on different trials it could be uh, different sizes on her fingers here we have some um, uh, motion capture device so that we can capture exactly how big she's making her fingers without having to say you know put a ruler in there and and measure every trial. Then what we asked her to do is um, instead of telling us you know how big you think it is just go out and pick up the object and when she does that we'll look at how her grip aperture changes as she goes to pick it up and it should scale with the size of the object. Now this task actually grasping the object is a how task so it should require the dorsal stream which for her is intact she should be good at it whereas the perceptual estimate requires the ventral stream which for DF is damaged so she should be bad at it. First let's look at a con control participant so someone neurologically intact like, like you or I and we're gonna have uh, us grasp an object that's either a small object it's two and a half centimeters or a larger object five centimeters and what we should see what we do see uh, in neurologically intact individuals is that if we ask you to grip something small your maximum grip aperture is relatively small and if we ask you to grasp something big your maximum grip aperture is larger so here we're seeing that the size of your grip aperture scales to the size of the object so that's good performance for a neurologically intact individual we should also see that sort of performance that scaling of grip aperture when you make a perceptual estimate so if I if you show me something small I should say it's small if you show me something bigger I should say it's bigger um, so that would look uh, like this the small object I make a small aperture bigger object I make a bigger aperture so we're, we're showing appropriate scaling to the size of the object so that's good perfect normal performance here's DF so for DF she is just as good at control at scaling her grip aperture when she goes to pick up the object that's because it requires her dorsal stream and her dorsal stream is completely intact now when we say hey how big do you think that object is we see very poor performance just like when we asked her what's the orientation of the mail slot um, she does not scale the size uh, the size of her grip aperture to the size of the object in both cases she seems to say it's big she doesn't know if we ask her uh, how confident she is in these judgments she'll say I'm not confident at all I can't tell what it is I'm looking at I can't tell what the size is and that's because that requires her ventral stream and it's damaged so again that same dissociation we saw uh, in the mailing task I want to try to illustrate what we're seeing here so uh, imagine a small object so this is the one that's two and a half centimeters and if we ask DF to grasp that, so what I, my drawing, my poor drawing here is supposed to be the index finger and the thumb, and here they're a small distance apart. So if we show her a small object, when she goes to grasp, she makes a small grip aperture. And when we show her a big object, she makes a much bigger grip aperture. That's good. So grasping, she's great because she uses her dorsal stream, which is intact. When we say, hey, how big do you think that is? use your ventral stream to give us a perceptual estimate she's bad we show her something small and she says it's big and we show her something big and she says it's big she doesn't know so those two slides uh, we're just trying to visualize uh, the data from that, that graph Let's skip ahead my notes here okay so that's DF really good evidence that what abilities uh, lie uh, or are mediated by the ventral stream and visually guided action are what are how abilities are mediated by uh, the dorsal stream that ends in the posterior parietal cortex this story gets even better substantiated by having an, a second individual who has the opposite uh, symptoms and damage so DF damaged ventral stream intact dorsal stream um, Milner and Goodale the the genius of their research is that they found a second individual RV 
Um, so different uh, initials this case, but also happened to be a middle-aged woman uh, with who, who had uh, a brain injury who has the exact opposite damage. So her dorsal stream is damaged, and we're going to see that she's bad at visually guided action at those how tasks, but her uh, what abilities, her ability to tell you what it is she sees, so her ventral stream, which is not damaged, is completely fine. So DF and RV are uh, the opposite of each other, and in science we call this a double dissociation. And it's a really strong form of evidence that these two areas do in fact have, have different uh, functions. So RV, the condition where your dorsal stream is, uh, is damaged is called optic ataxia. And I don't kind of like this name as much as visual form agnosia, but uh, you know, they, I, I didn't come up with it, it's just what we have to work with. So ataxia means poor coordination. So optic vision, this, the idea is they're trying to say here is that you have poor coordination when using vision. So it's, a, it's maybe not the best term, uh, but basically um, she has poor how abilities. Her visually guided action uh, is poor. So RV, uh, also a middle-aged woman when she had a brain injury similar to DF, uh, but in her case, uh, she had uh, a few strokes uh, that resulted in damage to her parietal uh, lobes. And this condition is called optic ataxia. We're going to see she has poor ability to reach for objects or to use vision to guide her action, poor visual motor control, but her uh, perception is just fine. So the exact opposite of DF. So here's a picture of uh, reaching for uh, maybe say a, a small ball like a squash ball or a racquetball. And for you and I, uh, neurologically intact individuals, when we reach for an object, much like our hand scales to our grip aperture, the shape of our hand will also um, conform or be positioned in a, in a natural um, coordinated way to pick up that object. So you can see here the fingers are, are coming so that they wrap around this racquetball. So that's that's neurologically intact. Now here's RV. RV has a very poor ability at using vision to guide her action because to do that you need a dorsal stream and her dorsal stream is damaged. So here she is trying to pick up the same racquetball and see her hand it's just kind of reaching out as big as possible. It's not this nice coordinated movement and her strategy what she does when she reaches for something is she tries to make her hand big in hopes that she touches it. Because if she can feel it, her tactile system is completely intact, so that she can then, instead of using vision, just rely on her sense of touch to pick up that object. So she's just making her hand big, hoping she touches it, and then she can then use her intact sense of touch. And on this trial, same sort of thing, she made her hand big, but in this case, she actually missed it completely. Uh, so very poor visual motor control. Her how abilities are um, damaged uh, extensively. So let's look at some of the same tasks that DF did, but this time with RV. So if we show her these drawings, she'll say, that is an apple, that is a book, that is a boat. <laughs> when she sees something, to, to know what it is, that's the ventral stream, her ventral stream's intact, no problem with this at all. If we then say, okay, well, can you copy what you see? Notice how her drawings aren't that great. And that's because to draw, you need to use vision to help guide your action. You need to see where you are on the page and make adjustments. And that is exactly what RV has lost. So her drawings, the reason that they're actually okay is because um, she still knows what it is, uh, but she has trouble using vision to guide her actions. So her drawings are about as good it, as if um, I drew an apple with my eyes closed. So if I close my eyes, I can draw, but now I'm not using vision to guide my action, and it's going to look a little sloppy. And that's basically what we see with RV, even with her eyes open, because um, even with vision coming in, the dorsal stream is damaged, so she can't use vision to guide her actions. So she can tell you what these are. She has trouble drawing because her ability 
to um, make visually guided movements is impaired because of the damage to her dorsal stream. Here's RV on the mailbox task, and these are both trials where she actually goes to try to mail the letter. And remember, RV was good at mailing the letter, sorry, DF was good at mailing the letter, so what we're going to see is RV is very bad at mailing the letter. Um, on this trial, it looks like she actually guessed right, but there's lots of trials uh, where, where she hits the wrong spot. To show this like we did before, so control participants would be good at both posting and perceptual matching, RV is horrible at posting. You say, okay, go ahead, mail this letter, boom, and boom, you know, she's all over the place. Um, but if we say, hey, uh, RV, just tell us what the orientation of that mail slot is, she has no trouble at all. And again, uh, just like this was a weird dissociation for DF, I think it's also weird for RV. So you, you, you hold up a mail slot and you say, okay, RV, what is the orientation of that mail slot? She says, it's this way. You say, okay, great, you know the orientation of the mail slot, so go ahead and mail it. And even though she knows that it's upright, she just told you what orientation is when she mails it, she does very poorly. And that seems really weird. And it's because these two areas of the brain are independent from one another. Even though her ventral stream is working, that information cannot make it to the dorsal stream to help her reach. Okay, so we, we also reproduced, or, or Milner and Goodell, or Goodell and Milner, um, reproduced the experiment of, uh, with the object where you either have to grasp it or make a perceptual estimate. And just like you would predict, RV is now horrible uh, at grasping. And what we see here is she just is opening her hand big because she's using that strategy where, well, I hope I just touch it and then I can use my sense of touch. But when we ask her, well, how big is that object? Just show us, is it this big, is it this big? She's great. She sees a small object she's, and she makes a small grip aperture. She sees a larger object, she makes a larger grip aperture. So. Um, good performance on the what task, horrible performance on the how task. So DF and RV together uh, are, are quite the pair because what, uh, what one of them can do well, the other one cannot. So it's a double dissociation and it's really strong evidence that our what abilities are mediated by the ventral stream, which terminates in the inferotemporal cortex and our how abilities are mediated by the dorsal stream which terminates in the posterior parietal cortex. So a little trick to help you remember DF and RV and, and who's who. Uh, it's a little difficult with initials, they both happen to be middle-aged women, um, so that's not very unique. But what you can do is DF, she has a D in her initials, and that should tell you that her dorsal stream is intact. So you just need to remember that the D in her initial tells you what's intact. It doesn't tell you what's damaged. But if her dorsal stream is intact, we can then conclude her ventral stream is damaged. That's her what stream, so she's going to have visual form acknowledge. Um, she, she has vision, but without being able to tell you what the form or what that object is. This works for RV as well. Uh, I think this is just by chance. Uh, so RV has a V in her name, and again, the V will tell you what's intact. So her ventral stream is intact. Thus, her dorsal stream is damaged. That's her how stream, uh, and we refer to that as optic ataxia. She has very poor visually guided actions. Okay, hopefully that will help, I think, for our last example here of DF and, and RV. And in this experiment, they actually, uh, those other ones, although they did the same task, they were in different publications, this one was um, maybe even stronger because they did the same tasks in the same um, publication, the same journal article. So this is gonna follow the same sort of pattern of the mailbox experiment and grasping for those rectangles, um, but here they're just using these kind of odd shaped uh, shapes which uh, you can kind of think of as, as, as like maybe uh, a chip. How, you know, every chip is, is slightly different. So what they did in this experiment, in one of the conditions, they gave them uh, two of these shapes, 
um, at a time, and they had to say whether they were the same. So if you got these two, you should say, yep, they're the same. And if you got these two, a neurologically intact individual would say that, yes, they're different. So let's think about DF and RV. So DF, D, her dorsal stream is intact, her ventral stream is damaged, so DF should be bad at this task because this is a what task. We're asking for your perceptual estimate. What are you looking at? Are these two things the same or not? So DF should be bad. RV, she has a V in her name, her ventral stream is intact, so she should be good at this task. And when we look at performance, DF uh, got 52% correct, and that's basically guessing. You have a 50-50 chance here, and uh, her, her results are, are not significantly different from uh, 50%, so she's just guessing. RV, she did much better. Now you might be thinking, why didn't she get 100%? And that's because they actually made this task hard. Uh, even for you or I, we would probably only score 90%. These trials are very obvious, but they had some trials where it was very difficult to tell whether they were the same or not. So 90% is actually the performance you would expect from a neurologically intact individual uh, on this task, which is, had more difficult trials than these two obvious ones here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our what ability. Now let's look at how. And to do that, they had the, the individuals, DF and RV, go ahead and just pick up the object. So they only put one in front of them and they had to go and pick it up. They also tested neurologically intact individuals. And there's no one way to pick up one of these chips. But how we pick up things, what we typically see is that um, we like to, to, to split the mass of the object um, so that it's easier to balance uh, in our hands. And here, let's see, I have a coaster I can use as an example. So if I'm going to pick up this coaster, you know, I might pick it up here in the middle, or I might pick it up here, and I'm probably not going to pick it up by the pointy bits. Um, I'm going to pick it up in a way that makes it easy to balance and hold. What would be odd is if I picked it up here. It's possible, but I have to use a heck of a lot more force so that it doesn't you know, slip away than if I pick it up here. So when we pick up objects, we tend to, to, to pick them up to split the, the weight uh, in two. And that's what we can see in controlled participants. And because these were oddly shaped objects, there's, there isn't one way that they would do it, but you can see all of these ways, they're splitting that, that object in two in a, in a logical manner. So let's think about our two individuals. Uh, DF, so the D tells us she has an intact dorsal stream, and that is what we use to make visually guided actions, so she should be good. And that's what they found. So not necessarily, sorry, lost my mouse. <laughs> not necessarily identical, but if we look at where she chooses to pick up that object, she chooses to split the, the mass of the object in two, which makes sense. Now RV, her dorsal stream is damaged, so she should be bad at this task, and, and she is. So every once in a while, she'll make a grasp that actually looks decent, but a lot of the time, she's picking it up, kind of like how I did with that coaster. So way out to the side, you know, way out to this side, way out to that side. This is very poor performance compared to DF and compared to neurologically intact controls. So a little summary of DF and RV here, they are the opposite of, e of each other. So DF, she has damaged her ventral stream, so she's bad at perception, uh, but her dorsal stream is fine, so she's good at action. RV, who has optic ataxia, she has uh, damaged her dorsal stream, so she's bad at action, uh, and but she's good at perception because her ventral stream is intact. So if we go back to our schematic here of the visual system, vision starts at the retina, uh, and we're going to see this divide into a subcortical and a cortical pathway. So the first uh, major stop on the, the subcortical pathway would be the superior colliculus. Okay, good, got that right. <laughs> and then the pulvinar or the pulvinar nucleus. Uh, that, now we're going to go back to the, I numbered these so I could remember how it's animated. Uh, now we're going to go back to the cortical pathway where the first major stop is the lateral geniculate nucleus. Uh, from there it goes to the primary visual cortex. 
From the primary visual cortex, we see a, another major division. We have the dorsal stream that terminates in the posterior parietal cortex. This is also the termination of the subcortical pathway. Uh, so some nice redundancy in the brain, two ways to get information in the same place. This is similar to, say, the vascular system and the, the circle of Willis in the brain, that there's um, a few different ways uh, to circulate blood, blood to the cortex. And then down here, the other pathway from the primary visual cortex is our ventral stream, which terminates in the infrotemporal cortex. And what we've seen is that this pathway is, a lot, is what gives us conscious perception or our what abilities. And these two pathways uh, that terminate in the posterior parietal cortex are what allows us to use vision to guide our actions. So that's really neat, that dissociation between DF and RV. But you might be wondering, how much does that apply to us? And in some ways, it doesn't, because we have both streams intact. But with some other tasks, specifically visual illusions, we have actually seen um, dissociations in even neurologically intact individuals. So even in us, we can exhibit some of these bizarre contradictions that we see in DF and RV. Not as extreme, because both of our pathways work, but what we'll see is that sometimes our dorsal and ventral streams have different opinions and don't necessarily agree with each other. So we can see that with a few different visual illusions. We'll see two of them here, the flanker illusion, but first the, the Ebbinghaus illusion. And both of these illusions kind of rely on the same principle. So you may have seen this before, uh, where you're shown these two orange circles and you're asked which one is bigger. And you might already know the illusion here, but the neat thing about this illusion is even though, even if you know the truth, you still see the illusion. So to me, when I look at this, this one looks a little bit smaller, this one looks a little bit bigger. Now if I throw some lines up here, they're actually the same size. So I copied and pasted those you know, in PowerPoint. They are the same size. But because there are big objects around this one, it looks relatively smaller to its surroundings. And this one, because there's small objects around it, it looks relatively larger than to its surroundings. And that is what causes this illusion, where you'd say, well, this one looks a little smaller. This one looks a little bigger when they are, in fact, the same size. So here, the inner circles are physically identical, but perceptually different. There is an illusion that fools our perception. And remember, our perception is our ventral stream. So our ventral stream is fooled. Is our dorsal stream fooled? Well, let's find out. So this is kind of the same setup uh, as the mailbox experiment the, the, or those other grasping experiments. But now we're looking at neurologically intact individuals. And we're going to ask people with this uh, Ebbinghaus illusion to go ahead and pick up that middle circle. So here, imagine it's kind of like a poker chip. Uh, there's a physical object there that you can go and pick up. Um, so go and pick it up. That's a grasping task. That's a how task. You'll need your dorsal stream. Or instead, tell us how big that middle circle is. With your hands, just say, hey, it's this big, or it's this big. That's a perceptual task, a what task, and it will rely on your ventral stream. So first off, when we ask you for your perceptual estimate, how big do you think that object is? Let me move my screen here. What we see is that you think those objects are different sizes. So the white bar in this case is the one with the small circles. And you say, hey, it's a little bit bigger than this one over here that has large circles around it. So that's the Ebbinghaus illusion. And that's what we expect to see with this illusion. You think that this one is a little bit bigger than this one because it has small things around it and this one has big things around it. So this tells us that our ventral stream is fooled by the illusion. There's a significant difference in the size of our estimates of these two objects. What about when we say, well, go ahead and pick it up? And what you would think is that if I tell you that one is, is smaller or larger than the other, that when I go grasp it, we should also see that illusion. And what kind of falls with what we've seen from DF and RV is that we don't see an illusion. 
the dorsal stream here is not fooled. When we go to pick up these objects, our hand makes the same size in both cases. So our perception is fooled by the illusion, but the, our uh, how abilities, the dorsal stream, is not fooled by the illusion. So this is that same sort of weird dissociation between perception and action now in neurologically intact individuals. So the Ebbinghaus illusion, it does fool our ventral stream. When you see these, you're going to say that, yeah, this one looks bigger than that one. But when you actually go and grasp it, there's no illusion. So this is a dissociation between perception and action, uh, similar to what we saw in DF and RV. And perhaps this one is even more strange because you would think, okay, DF, RV, they have a brain injury. So yes, things are, are going to be off. But here, uh, things are, are, are still odd, uh, even though you're neurologically intact. So imagine if you ask someone um, who they were going to vote for, you know, Democrat or Republican, and one half of their brain said one thing, the other half of the brain said the other thing. You know, that would be odd. Uh, that difference of opinion within the brain should be resolved. But that's not always the case. Uh, and here we see that for, for vision. I don't know about political parties. But for, for vision, your dorsal stream can have one opinion based on what it sees. Uh, so it's going to say those objects are the same size. When I reach for them, my hand will be the same size. And yet your ventral stream has a different opinion. It says those objects are different sizes. And when you ask me, the ventral stream, um, how big is that? I'm going to say that they're different. But when you ask the dorsal stream, and the way you have to ask it is by saying go reach for it, it will uh, make the same grip aperture in both cases. So half of your brain thinks there is an illusion, and half of your brain does, is not fooled for the illusion. Illusions are quite popular to study uh, in psychology um, because similar to a neurological disorder that tells us about, um, well, this area must do this function because when we damage it, this is what's lost. Visual illusions can also uh, tell us about uh, how the brain works and, and how it, it can be fooled. So here's an interesting one. So this is not animated, it's actually a static image. And it's called the per, uh, per, peripheral drift illusion. So when you look at one part of this image, what's in the periphery looks like uh, there's movement. And there, the best estimate for, or one hypothesis for why this happens, is because in your peripheral vision, the cells, uh, I guess it would mostly be the rod cells, detecting the different colors um, get fatigued at different rates. And when one area gets fatigued and stops responding, your brain um, inappropriately detects that as movement. So, so very odd. If you're into these visual illusions, uh, I can't help but recommend this website. So every year they do a competition for the best visual illusion of the year. And it's often psychologists who, who win because they have an unfair advantage because they're, they're studying these things uh, in their lab. Uh, these are, are two of my favorite, actually by, by the same uh, Japanese researcher. And these ambiguous cylinders, uh, I think, are fascinating. And I actually uh, 3D printed one at Tech, and, and I, would, I would bring it to class so you could see it. Uh, unfortunately, that is uh, quarantined in my office at the moment. Uh, but, but take a look, and if, if you're ever on campus, swing by my office, and I can, I can show you an example of an ambiguous cylinder. We're going to go just a little bit deeper into these dissociations between perception and action. So far, we had talked about action as being exclusively in the dorsal stream. That's not entirely true. So we're going to look at that distinction now. There's actually a difference between real-time guided movements and memory guided movements. So most of the movements we make, I would argue, we make in real time in that as I'm moving to the object, I have visual feedback of what I'm doing. That's, that's normal. That's typically how we move to things. The other way we can move to things is based on memory. 
So if I look at this mug, now I, I, I know where my hand is, I know where the mug is, now I close my eyes. If I move to it now, that is a memory guided action. So I don't have real time visual information, uh, my eyes are closed, so we call that memory guided action. Those movements are definitely less common. Um, we, we like to keep our eyes open. Uh, you know, we're going to be more accurate when we, we have visually uh, guided movements. Uh, but memory guided movements do sometimes occur. Um, and here we're not trying to study the most common movement, but we're trying to learn about the brain. And sometimes we learn about that from odd situations. So memory guided movement, well, that's a little odd. Um, but we, we still learn about the brain from that, just like we learned about the brain from DF and RV, and they're you know definitely not uh, normal individuals, they're very special. So here they use the flanker illusion, which is a version of the Ebbinghaus illusion. It's a size contrast illusion. Uh, this one isn't as dramatic though, it's maybe not as, as fun to show your friends as the Ebbinghaus illusion. So what they, they did is they had a rectangle, um, so imagine like a, a physical domino, and beside it they would put another shape. So you would always be making a perceptual estimate about the shape on the right, or reaching for the one on the right, but this one uh, that we put to the left, we put it here to bias your perceptual estimate of this object. So if we have a small object beside the rectangle, you're going to say that it looks relatively larger. And here, the, this rectangle is the same size, the two on the right are the same size, but now we put something big beside it which makes it look relatively smaller. This is in, in the same way that having small circles or big circles around the, the central poker chip uh, worked in the Ebbinghaus illusion. This one isn't as big an effect, um, but there is a consistent illusion here. Uh, it's been studied for, for years uh, that when you look at, when you make a perceptual estimate of these two objects, we do see an illusion. Um, so in this experiment, they actually don't even replicate that condition because it was well known that you are going to see a perceptual uh, illusion here. So here's what they did. So they don't test perception. We're going to look at action and they're going to make a distinction between real-time guided action and memory guided action. And we'll go over how they did this a couple of times. So here are those dominoes and you're always reaching for the one on the right. Here there's a smaller domino to the left so perceptually you would think that this domino is a little bigger than it actually is. In one condition what they did is you could see these dominoes, you're sitting there, you're looking at them, you can see them, you can see them. This is the go signal so they play a tone telling you to go out and, and now make your movement to that object on the right. You can still see the object, you can still see the object, so when this is up here it means you can see the objects. And then as soon as you start to move, as soon as movement onset or movement initiation occurs, you can no longer see the objects. And the way they do that is you're wearing these glasses that basically close, so now you have to make your reach without visual information. This is still, somewhat strangely, considered a, a real-time guided movement because you have vision during the reaction time. And remember that this is when you prepare the movement. So you prepare the movement during the reaction time, and in this first case, you have vision as you do that, so you can prepare your movement based on real-time visual information. Yes, once you actually start to move, you no longer have vision, but by that time, you're starting to move, so you've already prepared your movement. This other condition we call occlusion. It begins the same way. You can see the objects, but now when you get the go signal, the glasses close. So now you have to prepare your movement without, time, without real time visual information. So this, you're going to prepare your movement based on memory. So the occlusion condition is memory guided action. The vision condition is, is real time uh, guided action, real-time visually guided action. So the important difference between here is do you have vision as you prepare the movement? Yes you do, real-time guided, no you don't, memory guided. Let me try to animate what these conditions would look like. So here's the vision condition, you're waiting at the starting position, you can see the objects, 
you get the go signal, you prepare the movement, and once you start to move, as soon as you start to go, that's when the goggles close and you have to make the rest of the movement without vision. In the occlusion condition, you lose vision sooner. So you're sitting there, you see the objects, you get a go signal, but as soon as you get the go signal, boom, the goggles close, now you have to repair the movement without vision. So again, the key is, do you have vision as you prepare the movement? So what might happen here? Well, they had two hypotheses. The first is, um, for these actions, maybe we'll see no illusion. We already saw with um, neurologically intact individuals that when we ask you to reach to the Ebbinghaus illusion, there is no illusion. So they use a, a slight tweak on the math here just to confuse us, I suppose. So they're comparing the right object in both cases, which was in fact the same size. Because they're the same size, um, if there's no illusion, you should make the same peak grip aperture in both cases. And let's just say it's five centimeters. So five centimeters here, even though this is a small object, five centimeters here, even though the object beside it is a large object. So five minus five, they then subtracted these conditions to look at the different score. And a different score of zero or not significantly different from zero suggests that there's no illusion. In other words, it doesn't matter the size of the object beside the one you're reaching for, your grip aperture is the same every time. So if we see a different score around zero, that means there's no illusion. What would the different score look like in an illusion? Well, they are going to subtract this condition from this one. Here, if there is an illusion, you might open your hand bigger because it looks relatively larger than the one beside it, so maybe it's six centimeters big. And here, you might open your hand a little smaller because it's beside something uh, bigger that makes it look relatively smaller, so maybe it's four centimeters. So if we subtract six from four, we would get a difference of two. So a positive difference, a difference significantly larger than zero, suggests that there is an illusion. So here are the results. So gray, these are the results in, in the condition when you head vision to prepare your movement. And what they found is that the, the difference was not significantly different from zero. And remember, that suggests that there's no illusion. So when you have vision during movement preparation, your movement is prepared with the dorsal stream, and therefore there's no illusion. And this matches with what we saw previously with the Ebbinghaus illusion. What happens when you prepare your movement without vision, when it's memory guided? Well, that's the, uh, the white bar in this case. And this, this score was significantly larger than zero, and recall, that suggests there is an illusion. You're changing the size of your grip aperture depending on the flanker. So when there's no vision during movement preparation, there is an illusion. And for there to be an illusion, that means that you must have used the ventral stream to prepare that, that movement. Because remember, the ventral stream is fooled by illusions. The dorsal stream is not. So when we see an illusion, that means you prepared that movement with the ventral stream. So here's what Goodale and Westwood concluded about real-time versus memory-guided action. So they said visual motor networks in the dorsal stream operate in real-time. These networks appear not to be engaged unless the target object is visible at the exact moment the response is required. So that's if the vision is required uh, available during reaction time. In other situations, so memory-driven action, that's what we looked at here, the control of action passes to other systems that access a representation of the target object laid down by the perceptual mechanisms of the ventral stream. So that might be a little complicated, but let's go to our, our overall schematic here. What they're saying is that how our ability to make movements is not always done by the dorsal stream. It's mostly done by the dorsal stream, specifically whenever we make real-time action. When we have vision as we move, or if we have vision while we prepare that movement. We use real-time action, and there's no illusion. But not all action is driven by the dorsal stream. And this is a little weird, but that's what the research suggests. Um, I don't know why the brain decides to you know, divide action that way, 
But if, we, if we're going to make a memory guided movement, so we don't have vision as we prepare the movement, then we seem to rely on a, a memory from the ventral stream. And recall, the ventral stream is fooled by illusions. Thus, our memory guided reach is also fooled by illusions. So this kind of elaborates on our how abilities. How is not exclusively in the dorsal stream. Real-time action, that the majority of how is mediated by the dorsal stream. But memory guided action, although they're, they're less common, um, typically don't make very many of these, they're actually mediated by uh, the ventral stream and um, will exhibit illusions. Let's tie this back to RV. So if we test RV, remember, so V in her name, that tells us her ventral stream's intact, her dorsal stream is damaged, and the bad news for RV is that her how abilities are impaired. She's very bad at using visually guided action or, or making reaches to objects, for example. But the good news is that although that's most of her, her movements, most of her how, we now know it's only her real-time action. So she should have in, uh, intact memory-guided action because that relies instead on the ventral stream, which for her, remember, V in her name, is intact. So what they did is they brought, once they realized there was this association between real-time guided action and memory guided action, they tested RV again on the same sort of task uh, where you either have to make a movement that was prepared with vision or prepared without vision. The one difference in this experiment is the object she's reaching for, they had all various different sizes, small, big, large, and they looked at how well her grip aperture scaled when it was a real-time guided action or a memory guided action. So these are the results for a real-time guided action. These rely on the dorsal stream, and for RV, her dorsal stream is damaged, so she should be bad, and she is bad. So the target object was two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters, or five centimeters. And if you look at her grip aperture, it's all over the place. We give her a two centimeter object, and on one trial, her hand opens six centimeters. On another trial, it opens nine centimeters. So very inconsistent, very poor how abilities, and that's what we expected. But when we ask her to make a memory guided action, so we show her the object, it then her, her goggles close and she has to move based on her memory. To do that, she uses her ventral stream, which is intact. And here, she shows pretty good scaling. Uh, like the mailbox task, it's not as good as, as you or I, but it's way better than how she did with real-time action. So we show her a two centimeter object and she's pretty consistently uh, opening her hand a small amount. We show her a, a much bigger object and she's consistently opening her hand a much bigger amount. So this is good news for uh, RV and she actually uses this as a strategy because she knows that her, uh, her real-time guided action is poor and that her memory guided action is, is better. So if it's up to her, if we don't control her exactly how she moves in an experiment, if she sees a mug and wants to move for it, she'll not use real-time guided action because then she'll be, have very poor coordination, optic ataxia. She'll hope to touch it and then use her intact sense of touch. So she knows she's bad at that, so she doesn't do it typically. What she'll do is she'll see the object and she's got two options here. She could close her eyes. That's going to force her to use her memory and she'll be as good as you or I at making that memory guided reach. It's not going to be as good as, as we would be with a visually guided action because she has to do it based on memory and your memory isn't as good as real time guided action. But for her, it's better because her real time guided, guided action, uh, which requires the dorsal stream, is really bad because her dorsal stream is damaged. Now, RV doesn't tend to close her eyes and reach for, for things throughout the day because you can imagine that would be a bit disorienting. What she often does is she sees the object, she looks away, and reaches for it where, where she can't see it. So that's a memory guided action, but she doesn't have to close her eyes and, and lose track of everything that's happening in the world. So let's summarize uh, DF and, and RV here and perception 
real-time action, and memory-guided action. So DF has an intact dorsal stream, so she is going to be good at real-time action, and she'll be bad at perception and memory-guided action. Uh, so I, let's see, I, don't, I think I do this across instead of up and down. So there we go. So yes, DF, bad at perception. RV, she's the opposite of DF, so she should be good at perception, and that's because her ventral stream is intact. So she's good. Real-time action, or you know, typical how, if you will, that requires the dorsal stream. DF has an intact dorsal stream, so she'll be good. Uh, RV, she should be bad because she's the opposite of uh, DF, but she's bad because her ventral stream is intact, her dorsal stream is damaged. And then we're going to flip those results one last time for memory guided action. Um, DF will be, will be poor at it, but thankfully memory guided action is uncommon. Um, so this isn't something that would affect her much in her daily life. Um, and although this is uncommon, RV can use it as a strategy to improve uh, her movements by looking away or closing her eyes. So she, w RV uh, is good at uh, memory guided action. One last note on the distinction between the dorsal and ventral visual streams. And this is going to lead us actually into our next section. So some have argued that studying visual illusions may be unfair to compare perception to action, because we know that perception and action are not the same thing. And it would be similar if we had research that compared apples to oranges. So yes, that research would say there's some similarities, you know, they're both around. But, you know, of course, they're also different. So if you cut into them, if you look at things deeper, then yeah, we're not too surprised that they're different. So some people have said using visual illusions might not be the best way to dissociate um, vision for, for action versus perception. What are some of these differences in these tasks? Well, they have different task demands, attention, there's lots of little things that are different and scientists um, you know we don't like many things to be different between two conditions we only want one difference if there's all these other things then our results uh, could be confounded and, and confusing so maybe we shouldn't be studying visual illusions the other thing is that DF has been re uh, retested and some of the dissociations those strong differences between perceptions and actions she initially showed um, aren't as strong anymore. Why? Well, has some of her damage recovered? That's possible. Has she come up with strategies? Uh, has her brain adapted? That's also possible. Um, and the challenge here is relying on people like DF and RV is that they are so few and far between. If we had a hundred DFs and a hundred RVs, we could use typical statistics to make some conclusions about these about the averages. But with DF and RV, whenever someone else comes along with an injury like this, it's very exciting because it's so rare. Often, um, say you have a stroke and it affects your dorsal stream, it usually affects other areas as well, and then we start to have you know lots of differences. And as scientists, we only want a single difference. So with DF and RV, you know, because it's unethical to go into someone's brain and, and take out these areas, we have to kind of wait for people with these very uh, unique injuries. And, and because of that, we have very few of them. The other thing is that the independence between perception and action between the dorsal and ventral streams has been overestimated. So yes, they are in different areas of the brain. Yes, they do different things. But the dorsal and ventral streams must or, or likely communicate at some level. So sure, maybe there isn't a single neuron where the dorsal and ventral streams will communicate with each other, but what about after a hundred neurons? Probably. A thousand neurons? You know, even more likely. So yes, there are dissociations, uh, but with some of this initial research, they were really pushing the, the distinct nature of these streams and now with some other tasks we do see that those streams sometimes at least do communicate with each other and resolve differences uh, but they also don't always do that 
Um, so some of these distinctions have been a bit overemphasized. We're going to look at the follow-up research that has addressed um, most of these issues in our next module.